Thanks for joining our church to watch or listen to this message. It means so much to us that you would track down this content online just to hear the Holy Spirit speak to you through this message. But let me also say, these messages were never meant to be a replacement for the local church. Please make sure that you are an active part of a local body of believers in your area. This is the body of Christ. Let's not just watch or listen online. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus together with the family of God. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Thanks for being a part of what God's doing in and through this church. But even more importantly, thanks for being a part of what God is doing in and through the church all over the earth. God bless you. Enjoy the message. Well, we are continuing our series this weekend uh, entitled First Love Again. And if you notice, that's the third title this series has been given because it was supposed to be 40 days of love. I told you why it's not any longer. And I just kind of titled it Love Again. And then the team was like, I don't think that accurately communicates this. So can we make it First Love Again? And I said, sure. So this is now in two weeks, the third series title. We're going to go with this one for the rest of the series. Okay, I promise you. Last week, we talked about loving God the Father. And this weekend, we are talking about loving God the Son. And let me just say at the beginning of this message, some of you are going to learn something new about Jesus in this message. Some of you are going to learn something new that Jesus did in this message. Some of you are going to learn a new why behind something Jesus did or does in and through this message. But here's what I would say, no matter what new thing you learn in this message, I just wanna calibrate us all. Every time Jesus is preached, the goal is to fall more in love with Jesus. The goal is not just to learn something new, to mine messages and go, I've never heard that before, I I learned something new, no, no, no. Every time Jesus is preached, the goal is to fall more in love with Jesus. And so I'm challenging you with this message. I want you to fall more in love with him as we talk about him. And this message essentially answers the question, what does Jesus do? What does he do? Now, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? But as we talk about things Jesus does as the son, my prayer is that your eyes would open up in new ways and you would celebrate all over again some of these things that Jesus has done, is doing, or was sent to do. Here's the first answer to the question. What does Jesus do? Point number one, Jesus shows us the father. Jesus shows us the father. Now, Let me set up the problem. John chapter 1 verse 18 tells us what the problem is. No man has seen God. No human person can see God. And here's the reason no human can see God. Because we have temporary bodies. We we have not received our glorified bodies yet. Only a glorified body can fully gaze and take view of the unveiled, unbridled glory of God. Exodus chapter 33. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. There's this incredible exchange between two best friends, Moses and God. And and Moses is building up his confidence. And finally, he just says to God, then show me your glorious presence. And I wonder if God didn't just kind of laugh, giggle a little bit, and go, <laughs> sweet, sweet little boy, uh, no one can, can see my face and live. But I will do what you have asked. But I'm going to have to hide you in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to cover you with my hand. And as I pass by, as my beautiful, glorious presence passes by, I'm going to remove my hand. I'm going to let you see me from behind. Because no man can look upon my face and live. Moses didn't have a glorified body. This is one of the reasons why I'm so excited to receive my glorified body. This is Philippians 3, 1 Corinthians 15. I can't wait to get a glorified body. Number one, because I'm pretty sure it's not going to have love handles. (laughs) And number two, way bigger than that, is my glorified body is going to be able to gaze upon his perfect beauty for eternity. I can't wait for this. But the negative side of that is I can't do it now 
because this is not a glorified body. I like to convince myself that it is, but it ain't. It is not. And the older I get, the less glorified it is. It's all right. It only helps me celebrate even more and look, look with anticipation to the day when I'm given a glorified body. But no man can see God. Think about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says that God has put eternity in the heart of man. I personally believe that every person is born with a desire to know God. Now, not everyone will choose to know God. And I, I get theologically, some of you are going down a path. I'm just telling you, God, Scripture says, has set eternity in the heart of man. Here's another way to say that. Man is bound by time, but is wired for eternity. We're bound by time, but we're wired for eternity. But think about this. If, if I'm born with a desire to know God, you know how hard it is to know someone that you can't tangibly see, hear, or experience? I mean, think about how my marriage would go if I couldn't tangibly see, hear, or experience Holly. They would complicate things, right? But here's what's awesome. John 1.18 doesn't just give us the problem. It also shows us the solution. Let's read it together. The rest of John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God, this is speaking of Jesus, is near to the Father's heart. He, Jesus, has revealed God to us. He had to become flesh for us to have an understanding of him. Our limited, human, finite minds could not even come close to understanding him. And so God became flesh. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Paul uses this word perfectly. This word image, it means an exact representation and revelation. Here's a one-liner form of Colossians 1.15. We get a perfect picture of the Father when we look at the Son. A really sweet woman last week, after the service, she came up to me, and, and she hadn't been in church in over 20 years. And she said, Jesus, I, I understand. I, I understand Jesus. But I do not understand God the Father at all. And I, I kind of just smirked and I said, will you promise me you'll be here next week? Because it's the first point of the message. Jesus is the visible picture of an invisible God. The son did not want me to live in confusion to what the father is like. So the son came to earth and was a perfect representative of the father. And Jesus, all the time, he, on his three years of ministry uh, on the earth, he talked about the Father all the time. And I really think he was baiting everybody. He, he just wanted to whet everybody's appetite so much that they just wanted to know the Father. And finally, in John 14, Philip has, I believe, had enough of hearing about the Father. At the beginning of John 14, Jesus is saying, there's more than enough room in my father's house for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you that I go to prepare a place for you. And when it's ready, I'll come back and get you. How many are excited for that day? Well, we got work to do till, until we get there. But Philip's hearing this awesome stuff about the father. And finally, in John 14, Philip says to Jesus, show us the father then. Just show us the father. Enough talk about the father. Okay, he's awesome. Show us the Father. And Jesus, just calm and collected, he goes, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus came to show us the Father. That leads us to point number two. Jesus models relationship with the Father. Jesus models relationship with the Father. Now, you're going to hate the first thing we talk about, the first subpoint, but you're going to absolutely love the second. Okay, so let's, let's try and navigate the first part. Jesus models relationship with the Father. 
Jesus modeled one-way submission to the Father. Jesus modeled one-way submission. Submission is the action or fact of accepting or yielding to a superior force or to the will or authority of another person. Now, I get it. There's been a lot of hurt related to this word. I have encountered this for the last two decades in ministry. That there's a pocket of people that seems to be getting larger and larger every year who have been hurt when they submitted. And so when the pastor uses the word submission, there's like a flinch mechanism. And I get it. And I'm sorry if you have been wounded or hurt at any moment in your life where you submitted, but can I please just sweetly submit to you? That doesn't make submission wrong. It just makes what someone did at some point in your life when you were submitted wrong. So don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? Just because one, one husband cheats doesn't mean all husbands cheat. cheat. Doesn't make marriage inherently bad, okay? Jesus modeled one-way submission. Now, here's what's so amazing about this. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternally co-equal. But when Jesus came to earth, fully God, fully man, hypostatic union, Jesus, as a man, modeled man's relational position with the Father. Submission. I'll show it to you. These are his own words. Jesus, in John chapter 6, verse 38, said, for I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. Now, when some of us hear this word submission and, and we see Jesus teaching us one-way submission, you might sarcastically think, oh, okay, well, the son came to teach all of humanity just to be like blind robots and just to submit to whatever the father says. That's not at all what Jesus says was his why for submitting on the earth. It's so much better and richer than that. Listen to what he says. John chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus says, I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. The reason Jesus was submitted to the Father wasn't blind obedience. It was obsessed love. Jesus says, Preston, here's the reason I do what the Father requires of me. I love him. And I want the whole world to know how much I love him. And here's one of the ways they'll know how much I love him. I do everything he asks me to do. I'm submitted to the Father. Jesus showed us this was meant to be the posture of our lives as children of God. We're not here to do what we want. We're here to do what the Father asks. Now, these people who, who just act like God is some divine taskmaster, ta taskmaster who just tells us what to do and doesn't care what we think, just do what I tell you to do. Okay, this is such an incomplete picture of love. Now, I'm going to read this one-liner because as I did run-throughs this week and preached it on Thursday, it's too much of a tongue twister for me to try and say away from reading it. So here it is. When the one we love would love to see something done. Our love for the one we love compels us to do the thing the one we love would love to see done. <laughs> this is also why I watch Hallmark movies. <laughs> There's a theological reason apparently. But this is how I see obedience. God says, hey Preston, this is what I would like for you to do. Now I'm not gonna make you. But it would have really warm my heart if, if this was what you did. And I respond, I'm sure you don't respond like this ever, but every once in a while I respond and say, well, I don't actually like doing that. I know it's not bad, I just don't like doing that, but I love you. And because I love you, I'll do that. The number one motive for obedience isn't to get a gold star in my Bible. 
It's to be like Jesus. And Jesus said, I obey the Father because I love him. Jesus modeled one-way submission to the Father. Okay, that was the hard part. Here's the fun part. Jesus modeled two-way obsession with the Father. Jesus modeled two-way obsession with the Father. Obsession is defined as a state in which someone thinks about something or someone or something constantly or frequently, especially in a way that is not normal. This also defines how I I feel about the Cowboys. (laughs) It is not normal. John 5, 19, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Watch this next part. Whatever the father does, Preston, the son also does. Here's how obsessed the son is with the father. Anything he sees the father do, he does. He doesn't imitate him. He does exactly what the father does. This reminds me of my sons when they were young, when they were little boys. They would play the sport that I played. They would say the words that I said. They would do the things that I did. Why? Because I was their hero. And one of the ways you can tell someone looks up to someone else is they mimic their behaviors. You can tell how I feel about Robert Preston Morris because I mimic him at times. For 20 years, I've studied him. And I love him. He is one of my heroes. And you will catch me from time to time doing something he does. Okay, here's how obsessed Jesus is with the Father. We read the first part of this verse, and it seems like a power sentence. The son can do nothing apart from the father. It sounds like a power thing. That's, this is not a power thing. Jesus goes on to say, everything the son does is because he saw the father do. That's obsession. The son is obsessed with the father. Now, let me show you the father's obsession for the son. John 17, verse 24. Jesus says, Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. There's a verse about the son's obsession for the children of God. He says to the father, here's how obsessed I am with these people. I want them to be everywhere I am forever. Obsession. He keeps going. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Do you hear what the son is saying of the father? Let me personalize it. He's saying, Preston, let me tell you something about my daddy. He doesn't just love me. He has been loving me since before anything which was created was ever created. I've been getting in on this love forever, and I will forever, because the father is obsessed with me. See this two-way obsession? John 1, 18, let's go back to it mentally for a moment. Speaks of Jesus and says, the one near to the Father's heart. This phrase in the original language literally means the one in the bosom of the Father. You talk about romantic terminology. Jesus, the one in the bosom of the Father. Get this picture. Jesus says, I've been getting in on this love forever. The Father's obsessed with me. John 1 18 actually gives us a snapshot of what that love looked like. It's like Jesus, and this is anthropomorphic language, which just means a human way to try and describe something that's not human. But it's this picture of Jesus, God the Son, laying his head on the bosom of the Father. You know what this reminds me of? The most consistent times in my life where I have cried were when my children were babies. And I'd go into their room, sit in the rocking chair, 
and I'd hold them. I'd sing over them. I'd pray over them. I'd talk to God in front of them. And almost every time, at least 85% of the time, I ended up weeping. Because there's something special when a daddy or a mommy holds the baby right here. And clearly something special is happening inside of the baby because every time they fell asleep, Holly would say, babe, you are the best at putting the kids to sleep. And it wasn't until Thursday night when I heard myself say that out loud that I learned that was actually a trick. It had never crossed my mind that what she was actually doing was getting me to put the babies to sleep by saying, you're so amazing at it. And I was like, yes, I am. And that was a trick. But every time when I would hold them like this, I remember so many times just weeping in the presence of the Lord. There was just something special as a daddy holding my baby right here. And John 1.18 paints this picture, this obsessive picture of the father's love for the son. Now, as though things couldn't get any better, now let me show you the father's obsession for you. John 17.23, Jesus says, May they, disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, Children of God, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Remember what we prayed during the prayer? Want to know why there's such a, a war against the unity of the church? This verse right here. This verse right here. Jesus says, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. This is about to ring yo bell. Let me, let, me, let me give it in the Preston paraphrase. Jesus looks at me as a child of God, looks at you. When I say my name, you just put yourself, your name into that same space. Jesus says, Preston, let me, let me tell you now something about my daddy's love for you. Preston is going to blow your mind. But the same exact measure the Father loves me with, Preston, the Father loves you the exact same way and amount. Why don't we wake up every morning of our lives and go, the Father loves me the exact same way and with the exact same measure as the Father loves Jesus. I just don't feel loved. Nobody loves me. That's not true. The Father is obsessed with you. And Jesus came to show us. Jesus models perfect relationship with the Father. And one of the best aspects of their relationship was two-way obsession. Here's one of my goals. I've never told you this before. But by the time I die, I want him to feel that I am as obsessed with him as he is with me. It's going to take my whole life to try and pull off. This is not, I refuse to let this be one-way obsession. I want my life to model two-way obsession. I want to live a life that reveals to everybody around me that I am fully aware and convinced of the Father's obsession for me, that the Father loves me just exactly the same way with the same measure as he loves Jesus. You believe that? That will change your life. Jesus modeled it. That's one of the reasons he came. That brings us to point number three. Jesus brings us to the Father. This is a quick one, but a very important one. 
What does Jesus do? He brings us to the Father. The entire reason Jesus came was to bring us to the Father. Here's the problem. Sin. When sin entered the world, it created relational separation between God and man. But the Bible tells us God made a way. Listen to what 1 Timothy says in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator, one person in the middle, who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Jesus Christ. Jesus saw the relational separation between me and the Father and said, oh no, 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 no. I've seen the way my Father looks at him before he's even been formed in his mother's womb. I hear the way the Father talks about Preston. No, 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 no. Something must be done. And Jesus said, I'm the only one who can. I must leave, temporarily leave, all of the amazing benefits of being co-equal with the Father. I've got to temporarily set that aside. Go to earth as a man, fully God, fully man. I must live a perfect life because Preston can't. And then I must die in his place so that Preston can have access to eternal relationship with the Father who is so obsessed with him. And so Jesus did. And so he did. He closed the relational gap sin created between me and the Father. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I love it when he talks like this. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Here's the one-liner. Jesus is the way, but the Father is the destination. Woo! (laughs) Jesus is the way. Many of us have heard that all of our lives. The way to what? The destination. What's the destination? Heaven, the Father, forever. If you receive the communion elements when you came in, I want you to grab those and go ahead and take out the bread. And while we're doing this, let me just say, if if you're not yet a believer in Jesus, uh, I'd ask that you not do this with us. And here's why. It's not because you're bad. Uh, This is a very special thing. Let me say it another way. This is a very special benefit of being a child of God. And if you are not yet a child of God, you've not yet given your life to Christ, let me just tell you, you're not bad. You can get in on this. You can absolutely get in on this. But taking communion with us is putting the cart before the horse. So if if you don't know Jesus personally as your Savior, I'd love to talk to you after the service. I would love to talk with you. But this is a very special moment between the Father and his children. So if, if you're not yet a believer in Jesus, we practice what's, what's called open communion, which means if you're a member of another church, that's okay. But if you're not a member of God's family yet, I'd ask that you just politely just watch. Just watch. And my prayer would be that as you watch, something would be stirred in your heart and you'd say, I want in on this. I absolutely want to be a part of this. This happened on Thursday night. Does anybody else besides me have trouble getting off that top? <laughs> layer and they gave me another one just in case Uh, because it totally happened the other night and is there a trick does anybody have a a trick to this any and it's like all of you are watching and so that makes it even yeah the, the problem is I can't separate I am not handing this to someone else look at this I am too stubborn to let y'all stand there just in case I can't get this done. Oh, oh, nope, nope, nope. Thought I had it. Goodness gracious. We don't have enough time. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Appreciate it. That's just, you knew that was going to happen. Let me give you, for some of you, a new way to see communion. 
the son loves the father so much. And the son saw how much the father loves you. And the son, seeing the problem sin created between God and you, came to this earth, took his body, and said, this is the only way. And that night, God the son sat with his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And what I love is Jesus didn't say for all of you, even though it does apply. It was a personal you. As though he looked in your direction and said, I did this for you. I did it for all of you. But that's not nearly as romantic as God the Son saying, as if you were the only one, I did it for you. This is my body, which was broken for you. The only way you're going to be able to receive forever the relational access and to experience the loving obsession of the Father is if I allow my body to be broken for you. And so he did. Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat this bread, remember, I was the one. I'm the only one who can bring you to the Father. Let's take the bread. In the same way, that night, Jesus took the cup. And if you'll allow me to use a little bit of the Preston paraphrase. I'll personalize it for me. I want you to personalize it for you. It's as though Jesus said, hey, Preston, I know you. And every once in a while, you let some of the mistakes of your past and present cause you to put your head down in a way they don't feel you can look the Father in the eyes. And I want you to know something. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Precedent shed for every one of your sins so that they are covered, so that you can boldly, confidently go in to the presence of the Father, not with your head down, but your head up. Pressing it's my blood that covers all of your sins. You are covered in my blood. And this is why the Father can receive you. Because you've received what I did for you. Every time you drink this cup, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember it was my blood that gave you access to eternal relationship with the Father and access to his presence. Let's take the cup. You can just set that aside and then afterwards you can throw it away. Very quickly, let's go through point number four, but let me, let me tell you, point number four is really the preface to message number three. Okay, so message number two is for all intents and purposes over. All right, those three points, message number three. But this is the in-between. All right, I can't, we can't talk about God, the Holy Spirit, if we don't talk about this fourth very important point. Okay, point number four. This is one of the things Jesus does, one of the most important things. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Now, this might be new information to some of you, but I assure you it's scriptural. You can, you can pour through scripture and see this. Can't cover all of the verses, but the Bible teaches three baptisms. Many uh, grew up in the church thinking there are two baptisms. We absolutely believe that scripture teaches three baptisms. So I'm not, I'm not going in sequential order, 
uh, so to speak. But I'll start with the one that everybody kind of thinks of when they hear the word baptism. Which one? Water baptism, right? Baptizo. It, it means to immerse, to dip. And if you're growing up uh, in, in my family with a, a bunch of PKs and a grandfather in ministry, pool time, when all the cousins would get together, we would not dip one another, we would try and drown one another. You know, you're, you're especially sinful, stay down, get, get it all off, you know. But that's what the word means, it means to immerse, to, to dip in water, okay? There's a verse in scripture that I think has kind of contributed to a little bit of misunderstanding about whether there are two or three baptisms. It's Acts chapter two, verse 38, it's Peter's command. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. And this is speaking of a water baptism. Each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now it sounds like that at salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit. And we do, but we don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I can show you another verse. Acts chapter 19, verse 2 Paul stops in Ephesus and, and he is talking to some disciples. Listen to their discussion. Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Hey, check that out. These people are saved. And Paul says, have you received the Holy Spirit? Since you've been saved. And they said, no, we didn't even know there was such a thing. Just for those of you who have been taught for many, many years, there's only two. Now, let's get to the second one. Remember, this is not sequential, but let's talk about salvation. At salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. We're all baptized into one body. Not water. Since speaking about water baptism. Whose body are we baptized into at salvation? The body of Christ, correct? Romans 6, 3. Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus, so not in the name of Jesus, baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. At salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. Now here's the third baptism. Jesus baptizes us with or in the Holy Spirit. The prepositions are really important. Okay, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's at salvation. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. But then there's the baptism in or with the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus does. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. These are the words of John the Baptist. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy even to be his slave and carry his sandals. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We're going to talk more about this next week. And if you get a little bit nervous when the pastor starts talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit, I really encourage you to be here next week. Okay? Some of you might have been coming here for a while and you might be like, I didn't even know this church or Preston believed these things. It didn't happen last week that we just started. This is not new theology to me. Okay? This is a very important part of being a Christ follower. And I really want you to be here next week because we're going to talk about some amazing things, some unbelievably supernatural benefits of walking with the Holy Spirit, not just being baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay? All right, that's the pre preface for next week. Let's recap this week. Jesus is the most amazing one who will ever walk the face of this earth. Jesus, God the Son, came to this earth to show us the Father. 
He wanted to eliminate all the confusion. Preston, I want to show you what the Father is like. If you've seen me, you've seen him. But Jesus didn't just settle for showing us the Father. Jesus modeled the kind of relationship we are allowed to have with God the Father. Just think about that. I'm not talking about whether you do or not. I'm just talking about the fact that you are allowed to have a two-way obsessive relationship with the God of the universe. Are you kidding me? This is not religion. This is a relationship better than I'll ever be able to wrap my mind around. Jesus came to show us, not just tell us, to show us that the same way the Father loves him, the Father loves every one of his children. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus came to bring us to the Father. And every time I say those words, I just get this picture of God the Son. Every time someone gets saved, I just imagine Jesus being like this. <laughs> Father, 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 here you go, another one you love. Another one. Jesus said, greater love had no man than to lay his life down for his friends. Jesus showed us what love looks like. He died for us. Why? Just so he could do this and go, Father, 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 here you go. Here's James Preston Morrison and the two of you can spend forever together being obsessed with one another. Jesus came so he could bring me to the Father. I don't ever want to get over that. I want to spend forever with the Father. I, I want there to be moments like my children had with me when they were babies. I want to have moments like that God the Son has with God the Father. My head in his bosom that were so close and we experienced that moment between Father and Son. I want to get in on that forever. I've experienced what it's like to, to be told I love you and then for them to do the opposite of what love is and run away from me. I want to forever be held by the one who is perfect, the one who is love. And Jesus came to bring me to him, to bring you to him. This should change the way we live our lives. God the Son did all of that and a whole lot more for me, for you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes.